Hi. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. David and I frequently hear this verse cited to disqualify any church association, calling churches organized religion, Babylon the Great. Did Jesus speak against the church, against organized gatherings of believers? Did Jesus cancel gatherings of more than two or three? And when does organized religion start? Must all gatherings be spontaneous? What does the context of this passage that I just read, this single verse actually that I just read, tell us about gatherings and Jesus' counsel on church? I'm going to begin by, by reading 15 to the one that we just read, 15 to 20. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose in earth, on earth, will be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So in context, the two or three are associated with a larger group of believers. Or what does verse 17 mean when it says, if he refuses to hear them, the two or three, tell it to the church. Jesus only mentions by name the word church, ecclesia, twice in the four Gospels, in this chapter as well as in chapter 16. The promise is that the church would always exist and nothing would defeat it in chapter 16. In Acts 2, 47, after Peter's sermon, we are told the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Church, synagogue, gatherings, uh, well, I should say church, synagogue, and ecclesia all really mean gathering. That's the basic meaning, a visible assembly of people. So uh, in, the, in the Acts 2 one, there was at least 3,000 believers added to the church. It's nothing mystical here. This, this is a visible assembly of Christians or believers. Are we still captive to the Watchtower teaching about the church? Do we still believe Watchtower propaganda against the church? And do we recognize the body of Christ? I wanted to share with you a helpful essay by C.S. Lewis that I just read recently and, and thought, yes, this would be a good one to read for us uh, witnesses and ex-witnesses who are hesitant to have any involvement with churches. His essay is called Membership. It's in this book, Fern Seed and Elephants, and other essays on Christianity. So I'm going to just read you portions of it. No Christian, and in, indeed no historian, would accept the epigram 
which defines religion as what a man does with his solitude. It was one of the Wesleys, I think, who said that the New Testament knows nothing of solitary religion. We are forbidden to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. Christianity is already institutional in the earliest of its documents. The Church is the Bride of Christ. We are members one of another. Members of one another. Sorry. In our age, in our own age, the idea that religion belongs to our private life, that it is, in fact, an op occupation for the individual's hour of leisure, is at once paradox paradoxical, dangerous, and natural. It is paradoxical because this exaltation of the individual in the religious field springs up in an age when collectivism is ruthlessly defeating the individual in every other field. I, I see this even in a university. When I first went to uh, Oxford, the typical undergraduate society consisted of a dozen men who knew one another intimately. Hearing a paper by one of their own number in a small sitting room and hammering out their problem till one or two in the morning. Before the war, the typical undergraduate society uh, had typical undergraduate society had come to be a mixed audience of one or two hundred students assembled in a public hall to bear a lecture from some visiting celebrity. Oh, to hear. I'm sorry. I don't see very well anymore. Okay, even on those rare occasions when a modern undergraduate is not attending some society, he is seldom engaged in those solitary walks or walks with a single companion, which builds the mind of the previous generations. He lives in a crowd. Caucus has replaced friendship. And this tendency not only exists both within and without the university, but is often approved. There is a crowd of busybody self-appointed masters of ceremony whose life is devoted to destroying solitude wherever solitude still exists. They call it taking the young people out of themselves or waking them up or overcoming their apathy. If an Augustine a Vaughan, a Trihern, or a Wordsworth should be born in the modern world, the leaders of a youth organization would soon cure him. There is the danger that real Christians, who know that Christianity is not a solitary affair, may react against that error by simply transporting into our spiritual life the same collectivism, which has already conquered our secular life. That is the enemy's other stratagem. Like a good chess player, he is always trying to maneuver you into a position where you can save your castle only by losing your bishop. In order to avoid the trap, we must insist that though the private conception of Christianity is an error, it is a profoundly natural one and is clumsily attempting to guard a great truth. Behind it is the obvious feeling that our modern collectivism is an outrage upon human nature, and that from this, as from all other evils, God will be our shield and buckler. <clears throat> the Christian is called not to individualism, but to membership in the mystical body. A consideration of the difference between the secular collective and the mystical body is therefore the first step in understanding how Christianity, without being individualistic, can yet counteract collectivism. At the outset, we are hampered by a difficulty of language. 
The very word membership is of Christian origin, but it has been taken over by the world and emptied of all meaning. What St. Paul meant by members, what we should call organs, things essentially different from and complementary to one another, things differing not only in structure and function, but also in dignity. Thus, in a club, the committee as a whole and the servants as a whole may both properly be regarded as members. What we call the members of the club are merely units. A row of identically dressed and identically trained soldiers set side by side, or a number of citizens listed as voters in a constituency, are not members of anything in the Pauline sense. I am afraid that when we describe a man as a member of the church, we usually mean nothing Pauline. We mean only that he is a unit. How true membership in a body differs from inclusion in a collective may be seen in the structure of a family. The grandfather, the parents, the grown-up son, the child, the dog, the cat are true members in the organic sense, precisely because they are not members or units of a homo homologous class. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they are not interchangeable. Each person is almost a species in himself. The mother is not simply a different person from the daughter. She is a different kind of person. The grown-up brother is not simply one unit in the class children. He is a separate estate of the realm. The father and grandfather are almost as different as the cat and the dog. If you subtract, subtract any one member you have not simply reduced the family in number. You have inflicted an injury on its structure. Its unity is a unity of unlikes, almost of incommensurables. That's a difficult word. <laughs> and it kind of means um, things that don't... Uh, I'm going to define it this way, that things things that don't seem to fit together but are together. I don't know. You can look it up if you don't think I'm right. <laughs> okay. Uh, he further says, a convict has a number instead of a name that the collective idea carries to its extreme. Oh, that is the collective idea carried to it, its extreme. But a man in his own house may also lose his name because he is called simply father. That is membership in a body. The loss of the name in both cases reminds us that there are two opposite ways of departing from isolation. The society into which the Christian is called at baptism is not a collective, but a body. It is, in fact, that body of which the family is an image on the natural level. If anyone came to it with a misconception that membership of the church was membership in a debased modern sense, amassing together of persons as if they were pennies or counters, he would be corrected at the threshold by the discovery that the head of this body is so unlike the inferior members that they share no predicate with him save by analogy. We are summoned from the outset to combine as creatures with our Creator, as mortals with immortal, as redeemed sinners with sinless Redeemer. His presence, the inter interaction between Him and us, must always be the overwhelmingly dominant factor in the life we are to lead 
within the body. And any conception of Christian fellowship, which does not mean primarily fellowship with him, is out of court. And then this last part that I wanted to read is the function of equality is purely protective. It is medicine, not food. By treating humans, by treating human persons in judicious defiance of the observed facts, as if they were all the same kind of thing, we avoid immeasurable evils. But it is not on this that we were made to live. It is idle to say that men are of equal value. If value is taken in a worldly sense, if we mean that all men are equally useful or beautiful or good or entertaining, then it is nonsense. If it means that all are of equal value as immortal souls, then I think it conceals a dangerous error. The infinite value of each human soul is not a Christian doctrine. God did not die for man because of some value he perceived in him. The value of each human soul, considered simply in itself, out of relation to God, is zero. As St. Paul writes, to have died for valuable men would have been not divine but merely heroic. But God died for sinners. He loved us not because we were lovable, but because he is love. It may be that he loves all equally. He certainly loved all to the death. And I am not certain what the expression means. If there is equality, it is in his love, not in us. Equality is a quantitative term, and therefore love often knows nothing of it. Authority exercised with humility and obedience, accepted with delight, are the very lines along which our spirits live. Even in the life of the affections, much more in the body of Christ, we step outside the, that world which says, I am as good as you. It is like turning from a march to a dance. It is like taking off our clothes. We become, as Chesterton said, taller when we bow. We become lower, lowlier when we instruct. It delights me that there should be moments in the services of my own church when the priest stands and I kneel. As democracy becomes more complete in the outer world and opportunities for reverence are successful, successively removed, the refreshment, the cleansing, the invigorating returns to inequality, which the church offers us, becomes more and more necessary. In this way, then, the Christian life defends the single personality with from the collective, not by isolating him, but by giving him the status of an organ in the mystical body. So I found that was a helpful way uh, of identifying where I might have been thinking improperly about the church when I first left the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, the idea that it's the body of Christ. It's not just you becoming a member of a collective group. Uh, that's, that's too narrow um, a definition. But the mysticism that exists is, is something like the relationship between people in a family. So I just I thought his, his uh, analysis was very useful. I'm going to link to a video called If He Refuses to Listen Even to the Church, quoting from Matthew 18, do JWs believe Christ had and has an ecclesia? based on some readings that David and I were doing of scripture and, and of, of J.C. Ryle's take 
um, or his uh, exposition on ungiven texts of scripture. The second one is a severed head. XJWs and JWs don't sever Christ, the head, from his body, the church. This one is the second part of me reading from a sermon by a former pastor of mine, Victor Shepherd. So it's, it's part two of a, a series of three. 